I'm Steve Ehrenholtz, the president of TV Toastmasters, and I hope that you'll enjoy the program that we have for you today. I would like you to meet our Toastmaster for today's meeting, Carol Kormalink. Carol is a distinguished Toastmaster, and she is going to be shepherding our meeting through the various phases that we have prepared for you today. We have a studio audience here that will be participating in our meeting. And for those of you that are looking in from home, we'd like to extend an invitation to you to come and see us take uh, in our meeting as a guest. We meet at 7855 Mile Road, the Anderson Center Community Television Studio. Help me welcome our Toastmaster for today, Carol Cormeling. Carol? Thank you, Mr. President, and our most welcome guest. All the people in the audience are members. And all of our members who are vacationing down in Florida, and one of them's going to Geneva, Switzerland, and one of them's moving to Louisville. So we don't have too many of our regular members here today. But so anyone out there in the, audi in the viewing audience that would like to come see what a Toastmaster meeting is all about, we welcome you to join. For the benefit of our guests, we'd like to welcome Adam and April Castle. Adam is a student at Indiana Wesleyan University, and that's one of the projects that they, the communication students do, is to visit a Toastmaster Club and write us a report. And Adam promised me that he would send a copy to me because no one ever does. And he said, well, I'll do that. So let us give a, a welcome to Adam and April. And then we have a Brian Kirkpatrick that is running our camera, and let us welcome him. <laughs> our postmaster meeting is divided into three parts. The first is the impromptu speaking part. The second one is the prepared speech part. The third is the listening and the feedback, where we give an evaluation of what, what went well, what could be better, and what is best. Good, better, best. Our first order of the day is to have our word power, and he will come up and explain what he's doing, and that is Steve Ehrenholtz. And if you look on your agenda, you will see our fun word of the day. Let us welcome Steve Ehrenholtz, <laughs> Distinguished Toastmaster. Thank you, Carol. I was looking for a word for word of the day, and I went online, went to Miriam Webster's website, because that's a good place to pick a word of the day. And they had one of the little windows on the right-hand side, and it was talking about 10, I don't remember whether they were unusual words for insulting people or exactly what the title was like, but they had several terms that I wasn't familiar with. And the one that I chose to use for our word of today is the word mumpsimus. It's spelled M-U-M-P-S. I-M-U-S, so it's like the disease mumps with imus at the end of it. And the definition is a stubborn person who insists on making an error in spite of being shown that it is wrong. <laughs> I'm sure that none of you have ever met anyone like that. I also think we have a bunch of those folks in Washington right now. A little bit of background about the word. Supposedly this insult originated with an illiterate priest. I think that's kind of an interesting com concept, an illiterate priest. But anyway, it was with an illiterate priest who said mumpsimus rather than sumpsimus, which apparently is we have taken in Latin during the Mass. When he was corrected, the priest replied that he would not change his old mumpsimus for his critic's new sumpsimus. <laughs> so the word for the today is mumpsimus, it means a stubborn person who insists on making an error in spite of being shown that it is wrong. And I suspect if you use it on someone, they may not even know what it is you have called them until after you are out of harm's reach. <laughs> Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Steve, for such a fun word. And the challenge is to use it when you come up here. And I didn't know I am a mumpsimus. My niece is helping me reorganize my files. And I buy the third three cut files, but I only use the first and second. And so the third cut I turn inside out. So she's sneaking in a third cut, and, and I'm saying, no, 
I just want one and two. She said, but don't you remember? I said, you couldn't do that. And I said, well, I can. So I am a mumpsimus. It's If you got three cut files, it's wrong to use. <laughs> Not use that third one, but I'm a mumpsimus, and I'm going to use it. <laughs> Our next part is a fun part, and this is where you get a chance to use the word of the day. And we will have Dilly uh, Kameth? Kameth. to come up and give us our table topics today and you'll explain what they are to do and how long they have to do it in and if you will <laughs> welcome Delete. and I learned a new word the other day S-A-R-D-A-R -A -R, and I'm going what is yeah, that and yeah. it's supposed to be ethnic Indian yes, jokes? Yes it is. Well I never heard of it. Yeah, okay. just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you Carol. Um, good morning my name is Dilip Kamath I'm your uh, table topics master just for folks who don't know what that is. Uh, we have uh, five different topics. We'll call upon each one of you to talk about that topic. It is a randomly chosen uh, topic, so you'll get a chance to talk about it for about two minutes to two minutes, 30 seconds. So here we go. The first topic, what is your greatest fear and how do you overcome it? April? April. What is my greatest fear and how do I overcome it? Um, one would be skydiving. I think the best way to conquer that fear would be to go skydiving and jump out of an airplane. <laughs> Have I ever done it? No. Would I do it? Yes. Oh. So, thank you. The second topic today is how do you find work-life balance. Paul. Okay, Adam, take notes here. I'm going to be a little mumps in this because I always, uh, whenever I get up and try to do a, uh, a speech without preparing for it, my fault is I'm always saying, uh, 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 and I'm going to continue to do that despite uh, they're telling me not to, and I guess that's the definition of mumps in this. So, how to balance work and non-work activities. Uh, in general, to balance work and non-work activities, you try to want to separate, but I think as you get older, it all kind of meshes into one thing. Uh, I kind of like, see I'm saying, uh, I kind of like my work so that it almost becomes play after a while. I know that's terrible to say, but if you like what you do, and it's not really a job, it's a career, and you get into it, it's almost, and people say stop working, stop working, but it's almost kind of fun. Uh, you get good at it. You finally, when you get, I'm 48 years old, you kind of get settled into what you're doing. You don't, you're not trying to strive anymore. You're kind of getting real good at what you do. You can, it's almost like learning to dance. When you first learn to dance, you have to look down at your feet and you have to kind of concentrate on it. You can't look out at what's going on. You can kind of put things in automatic mode so you can kind of get more and more of a grasp of what's going on. So from a work-play standpoint, I almost uh, want to continue to work. And I know that's terrible to say because it's so fun to me. I don't want to stop doing that. Uh, when I do on, go on vacation, vacation is very unique to me when you do have a fun time at vacation. Vacations to me are actually kind of unique too. Actually going through the vacation is not as fun as actually preparing for the vacation or thinking about the vacation afterwards. When you actually go through that vacation, you were late getting in, they didn't give you the key, the, the ocean had kind of a bad smell to it or whatever. You know, you go through it and you're kind of like, okay, this is kind of fun, I'm paying all this money. But it's not really when you're actually going through it. But when you think about it, it's fun. So whether or not I'm having fun on vacation, not vacation, that's kind of the thing. And again, as you get older and older, things just start meshing together and it all is a continuum where there's not, it becomes less of a distinction to me. So that's just me, so. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Our third topic is, has football taken over America's favorite pastime from baseball? Steve? Uh, 
I'll repeat the question. Has football taken over from baseball as America's favorite pastime? Thank you, Mr. Table Topics Master. Has football taken over baseball as America's favorite pastime? Well, what kind of football are you talking about? The kind that they play in fall here or the kind that is soccer and other countries call it football? Or I see the little bumper sticker that says football, F-U-T-B-O-L. American football as an NFL. Mm -hmm. Well, my first inclination is to tell you I really don't care because I really don't pay attention to either one. My mother-in-law is an avid baseball fan, and thanks to the wonders of cable, she can watch three or four baseball games at the same time. My wife will complain when she calls my mother-in-law during baseball season. She says, yes, I can tell Mom was watching baseball because I would talk to her and I'd hear, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that's good, uh-huh, okay. And I know she can't wait for me to finish my call because then she can get back to her games. One of the things that I don't like about football or baseball is this bigger than life persona that the stars take on and some of them it doesn't matter how ill behaved they are nothing really seems to happen. I think that's what I dislike more about both of these sports rather than which one is taking over because I think they're exorbitantly expensive. They probably pay these people way too much for what they really contribute, especially in light of some of their behavior. And so, overall, I really don't pay much attention to it. So I'm sorry, I can't really answer your question directly. Mr. Tabletop Expensive? <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. The next topic is, what is your favorite number? And why? Carol? My favorite number is three, but I really don't know why, but it helps me a lot because if I park in a parking lot, when you get to be my age, you don't always remember where you parked. When you're younger, you just hone into your car. When you get to be my age, you go out the wrong door and think someone stole your car. <laughs> so it helps three. Okay, I'm the third car in the third row. I'm under the third letter of Kroger. <laughs> so I know that helps guide me to where I go. And if I'm trying to remember someone's phone number, if it has a three in it, that helps me remember. And I just like threes. And I do things in triads when I'm giving a speech. I usually have three reasons why I do something. And my one reason is it helps for my three, it helps me find where I am. It helps me with my speeches. So I, I like three. Three is a good number for me. And one time when we were at a shower and two of us had tied for the prize and I used my lucky number three, well, my mom had won the prize and I got the other prize. And I'm going, it's still my lucky number because I didn't want that prize. I wanted what I got. So three is my lucky number. <laughs> Thank, Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kara. The last topic today is share with us your favorite travel nightmare. Adam? Thank you. First comment I got to make, though, is for you, Carol. Three can't be your favorite when it comes to files if you only use two tabs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. My, my worst travel nightmare would have to be um, my wife and I were traveling to Florida and of course my lovely co-pilot said, I'll stay awake with you the whole time and I'll help you out and make sure that you stay awake so we don't have to pay for a hotel. Let's just drive on through. So I said, sure, let's go for it. So first eight hours in, as I look over and see the drool running out her cheek and head against the window, use the window, run it up and down to make her face go up and down, <laughs> you know, just for my pure amusement to keep me awake. Um, I then would, you know, turn the music on, whatever I could do. Well, I'd start going into this national forest. Nice area. Of course, it's pitch black. A couple animals ran out in front of me, just trying to pay attention. Well, next thing I know, the thing that catches my eye is the gas light comes on. E. I'm like, hmm, this isn't good. So I reach over and speak with my navigator, of course, and as she snores back in response. 
and grab the atlas and look at it and sure enough there's this huge green blob right in the middle of this national forest there's not going to be a gas station in the middle of the forest so we're going up and down these hills and every time i get to the top of a hill i put the car in neutral and coast back down to the next hill she sits up and says what are you doing she's like why do you keep putting the car in neutral i said oh no reason well, sure enough, we pull down the hill, and out of nowhere, here's this gas station. We coast into the gas station, and I said to the guy, I said, good thing I found you guys, because there would have been no way we would have made it very far. He said, we've had them pushed in here, we've had them towed in here, <laughs> they rolled in. He said, you wouldn't believe. We've had people coming here on foot. He said, one of the biggest things they sell is portable gas cans, because people have to walk back up the hill to fill up their car. So for me, that would be my worst travel experience. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. That brings us to the end of uh, table topics. Why did you very much, Philly? This was fun. We found a few bumpsomest people in there. April, do you know you're skydiving? That could be a speech. Everything that you do in life can be a speech. So you had a little mini speech talking about it. When you actually do that, that can be a speech. Okay. And Paul always has a, a good reply to the topic and Steve I'm with you I don't care about baseball football then my friend takes me to a baseball game and that one where they did 12 innings that was exciting even though the Reds did lose but that was <laughs> exciting because a guy proposed to his girlfriend on camera with that lady that dresses with the female suit and she accepted tears were coming down her eye and she accepted so that was neat and me that you're very keen on listening and very astute with my three cut file so I don't want to waste that time looking all the way over there when I can just hone down the first and second. I read time management one time <laughs> and that's why I don't waste time shifting my you have eyes. An evaluator? <laughs> because this is turning into a speech. <laughs> and then Adam you did great for not wanting to get up here and coming up you did fantastic so I really appreciate everyone's and Dee for stepping in there and doing our table topics. Thank you very much. And now for our next speaker, Stanley Glitchner. Speaking in public doesn't have to be a death sentence. At Toastmasters, we can help you overcome your fears. I really appreciate everyone's and Dee for stepping in there and doing our table topics. The prepared part of our the uh, educational session with the prepared speeches, Rick Davis, I can't wait to hear his speech. He's going to have a fun, fun speech here, I think. <laughs> and it's out of the Competent Communicator Manual. He's going through this several times now, many, many times, because he's already a distinguished Toastmaster and been through this and given 50, 60, 100 of other speeches. But I like it because it, his project was how to say it. So let's hear what he has to say about what old people know. He's not an old people, but I am. So let's hear <laughs> what he has to say. <laughs> Rick Davis. Somebody's going to kill themselves on this microphone table. All right. One of my goals in life is not to be too mumpsimus. Is that, <laughs> is that a, a way of using the word? I don't know. Kids today, they, they do their Twitter, they do their Facebook, they do their Google. But hey, old people know stuff too. <laughs> not just these young guys. What old people know. So I, I decided to put down on paper what old people know. These are things that we've picked up over the years, and I don't think enough young people know how to do this. One of the things we know how to do is use a rotary telephone. <laughs> when was the last time you saw a rotary telephone? You know how to manually focus a camera? You can't know how to do that anymore. We know how to get a passport. Kids today, they don't know how to get a passport. They have to go online or something. We, can, we know how to get a passport. They have, we know how to write a check. Kids today, they don't know what a check is. And on top of that, we know how to balance our checkbook. <laughs> My kid never balances his checkbook. He just assumes the bank knows what they're doing. You know how to fill out a tax return. 
An important one, we know how to find a book by the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> when was the last time you had to find a book by the Dewey Decimal System? We know how to find comics in the newspaper. They're right there at the back. <laughs> we uh, know how to adjust the rabbit ears on a television. Remember how you had to get to, you know, there's no ghost on that, that television? We know how to address a letter. Nobody writes letters anymore. You always do email. You know how to buy a car, buy tires, and how, how to license the car and how to insure the car. Nobody knows how to do that anymore. Either. Uh, we know how to read the stock exchange numbers in the newspaper so we tell if, I, if we can retire anytime in the near future. And we also know what the Dow Jones Industrial Average is. Nobody knows what that is. You know how to change a tire, know how to change the oil in a car, you know how to cut grass. We know how to recycle aluminum cans. These things are important. We know how to be polite. We know how to say please, thank you, open doors, pull out chairs, those sorts of things. We had to know how to make chocolate chip cookies that don't come in a in a squeeze thing. <laughs> <laughs> know how to do it from scratch. <laughs> know how to open a bottle of wine without breaking the, the top, you know, actually how to take a cork out. These are things that old people know how to do. We know how to order wine in a restaurant. I, kids, most kids today, they don't even, I mean, if, you, if it's not a Coke, it's, uh, that, that's what they drink. You know how to open a bottle of champagne, you don't want to spill it all over the place. You know how to order a steak, everybody's eating sushi these days. <laughs> Nobody knows how to order a steak. How to bake a potato in an oven, and, you know, zapping is fine, but you know how to bake a, a potato in the oven. How to pick out a good movie, nobody goes to the movies. Not to fry bacon in a pan instead of in a microwave. Not to find that dog's sweet spot so you really go after it. Arr, I like that. How to get the cat pissed off. That's always fun. How to make change for a dollar. Nobody knows how to make change for a dollar. They, you know. Uh, how to how to drive a, a car with a stick shift. Nobody knows how to do that anymore. How to turn the lights off in the house, that's important because uh, old people don't want to know that. How to turn down the turn down the heat in the winter time and turn up the air conditioning in the summertime, save a save a few pennies here and there. How to find a printed how to find a word in a printed dictionary. How to pronounce that word once you found it in the in a dic printed dictionary. How to fold a paper map. It's not something that you just uh, pick up on your own, you have to know how to do this. Ask an old person. <laughs> how to find the encyclopedias in the library. Wikipedia, everybody goes to Wikipedia. No, you can, there's, there's a whole section of the library that's just encyclopedias. How to vacuum a, a rug, how to hang a wet wash out on the line. Nobody does that anymore. Important one, how to locate the local Girl Scout when it's cookie time. We know, we all know this stuff. How to determine if you have high blood pressure, how to soothe an achy back, how to deal with a migraine headache. These are all things that when you get old you know how to do. How to make a doctor's appointment. My kid doesn't know how to make a doctor's appointment. Dad, why, why would I want to talk to the doctor? How to play a vinyl record. You know, you have to know how to play that, put that needle down. How to comb over a bald spot. <laughs> how to reset the smoke detector so that you uh, can turn the thing off. How to set a mouse trap. Nobody knows how to do that kind of thing anymore. How to add water to the car's radiator. You know, you don't want to do it when it's hot. You'll end up with water all over the place. How to change a car light bulb. That's an important thing to know. You just you can't always count on the guy at the gas station knowing how to do that anymore. You have to do that. How to pick out a good book. Nobody reads books anymore. How to wrap a present. You don't give presents. They Eat each other. I don't know how to cook a turkey, how to peel a potato, how to tune in a radio station. That's an important thing to know. You, it, you know, you, the days when you uh, actually had to tune in a radio station and just couldn't hit the button. That's uh, that's an important thing. How to tie shoestrings, how to open and close a pocket knife, how to lo loan someone money and actually get repaid. <laughs> <laughs> um, how to sew on a button, how to fix a zipper. How to buy flowers in a flower shop. Nobody knows what it, how do you think most kids would know how to get to a flower shop. They have to do it all online. How to send a telegram, that's an old one. How to clean an oven, how to parallel park, 
How to insert a floppy disk. Some of us still use floppy disks. <laughs> how to open and close an umbrella. How to rewind a VHS tape. How to store your record albums. How to play Red Rover. When was the last time you saw kids playing Red Rover? How to change tubes in the TV set. I like that one. How to adjust the, the horizontal and vertical uh, hold on the TV so it stops rolling. <laughs> Something we don't do anymore. How to paint a door, how to clean gutters. And of course, since we've been around so, so long, how to enjoy life. Madam Toastmaster. <laughs> I still don't know, but I, I did learn how to drive a stick shift with my brother's 34 Ford that he had, but I wouldn't want to drive a stick shift today. <laughs> my son loves a stick shift. His truck is a stick shift. But I don't know. That, that brake, the, the gas and, and the clutch. <laughs> Y'all know that hip, doesn't that? I'd like to begin uh, tonight with a uh, little joke. Um, this guy, he's a farmer, and he says, Hey, hello, hello? sorry. But see, seriously, folks. Um, uh, Speaking in public is no joke. The doc farmer says, a uh, doctor says, f chicken says, For help, call Toastmasters, the public speaking support group. <laughs> the chicken. We now come to the evaluation part of the meeting, and our general evaluator, our president, our, will be Steve Ehrenholz, wearing a hat as a general evaluator. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. As Carol mentioned, we are to that portion of our meeting which we will be providing feedback to our participants in, in today's meeting. The purpose of evaluations is to give people feedback on what it is that they're doing well, as well as providing information on things they might want to consider to enhance their presentation of material, to improve their speaking skills. We have a evaluator who will be giving us his evaluation for Rick Davis's speech today. I'd like to welcome Paul Wessels up here to give us his evaluation of Rick's speech. Thank you, Steve. Fellow Toastmasters, Rick. Actually, I thought that was your best speech. I've probably been here for a year and a half, and I can relate to that speech. Uh, project number four, it was how to say it, and it's basically using words uh, and sentence structure. I thought you did a great job with the words and sentence structure, and what I thought you really did good with one of the adjectives here is using rhetorical uh, devices. So similes, metaphors trying to uh, relate it to something we all really know, and I thought you did a great job on that. Uh, you stuck with the theme. The theme was what old people know. It was very human. I thought it was a very enjoyable. You could have gone on and on and on. It made me think about things that I see also that old people can do that young people can't do. And uh, just all the examples, there's just too, too many to relate to, and I just, it just made me go through my life, too, to say, okay, oh, yeah, you're right. I agree with that. I agree with that. Or it's worse than that. Believe me, it's worse than that. You were talking about bacon. They don't know how to cook bacon. They put it in the microwave. It's, there's pre-cooked bacon now. You can actually get bacon, so you don't have to mess with all the grease. It's pre-cooked. Stuff like that. It was, it was fantastic. I can relate to it. I've got a 9-year-old and a 13-year-old. So I am constantly saying the same kind of things to me. It's like, boy, they, and you just don't realize until you actually have to do things how much they don't know. And what you assume, the television, doing, and it would be the clicker. They lose the clicker. It's like, you got to be kidding me. You know, they won't even go out and, and, and try to find the clicker, or they want to find the clicker. They don't want to go up to the TV. And so I can relate to exactly what you're saying. One thing I remember, and again, it brought memories back to me, is playing. Kids don't know how to play now. They don't know how to go out and just get a stick and a ball and figure out what to do. Now, we may not let them play. We may not, we, we supervise them a lot more than, than we had to in the past. But just things like that, where, where kids, it's, it's a totally different society now. And uh, it's amazing how things drop off. So it really made me think about how things are changing. And can you imagine our fathers, grandfathers, didn't have cars and whatever, how things are changing these days. So. Uh, 
fantastic speech, uh, letters, writing, just everything. You can tell you sat down and thought about it, but to me, it seems like it would have been an easy one to write. Once you get on a roll with something like this, <laughs> and you start thinking back, and so to me, it was the most enjoyable, uh, very enjoyable, humorous, um, and I'm the kind where I get the story, I like the boom, 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 kind of a, a stand-up comedy kind of thing, but very sophisticated stand-up comedy, and it, it was an adult, uh, non, uh, you know, it, it didn't uh, uh, offend anybody or anything like that. Nice and clean, good humor, very sophisticated, well thought out. You can tell a mature person that knows what they're doing, has been around for a while, has said it. And not only clear, but sub behind the two jokes in one kind of thing, two, three, four jokes in one. So very good, uh, appreciated it a lot, very entertaining, and hope to hear more uh, from you in the future. Thank you. I wanted to second Paul's evaluation of your speech. One of the other things that I thought of as far as things kids don't know how to do, one time we were home visiting my sister and brother-in-law and their three sons, and their microwave oven had broken. So my sister and I had actually gone out to find a new microwave oven for them, buy a new microwave. While we were gone, the boys wanted to have hot dogs for lunch. And my wife was there. They were like, well, we'd like to have hot dogs for lunch, but, well, the microwave is broken. And my <laughs> wife says, well, you put them in, on the stove in a pot with water. And they were like, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm thinking, good heavens. I'm not sure how much confidence I can have in some of these things if we don't know how to boil hot dogs. But I really did, it. I enjoyed your speech as well. Our next evaluator that is going to give us his presentation of the things he was looking for during our meeting today is Dilip Kamath. He's going to be providing us with his Ah Counter and Grammarians report. He's going to be pointing out to us some of the verbal crutches that we use, some of the fillers that we really don't need to be verbalizing when we're talking. Additionally, if he's heard of any rather unusual or creative uses of grammar that may or may not be appropriate, we'll hear about those. And then the last thing that he tries to do is give us a count as to who has all used the word of the day, mumpsimus. Help me welcome Dilip for his grammarian and odd count report. I will go through the odd counter first and then the use of the word mumpsimus. April, you had one R. Paul, you had 12 R's the first time, but seven were mostly demonstrating. <laughs> Rick, you had one R. And Paul, the second time around, you had five R's. Okay. And none of them were demonstrating. <laughs> um, the count for the word mumpsimus. Paul used it quite a bit. I think he used it thrice, repeated mumpsimus, and Steve used it once. Thank you. I used it too. Oh, Carol, you used it. Thank you, Dilip. The Dilip's also running a camera, and I know that it is a little bit hard to keep track of your role in the meeting when you're also listening to the director telling you that they want you to pan right a little bit or frame up on the person who's in front of the camera. So I can appreciate Dilip's challenge with running the camera and listening to everything at the same time. Our third evaluator that we're going to hear from this morning is our timer, Mary Arms. And the reason that we time in a Toastmasters meeting is so that we learn to speak within the time constraints that we have. How many of you have been to meetings that just went on and on and on and on? Most people don't complain when a meeting runs short. And we have to practice a certain efficiency of words and also get to the point. Mary's going to share with us how well we've done today as far as our timing. Mary? Well, hello, everyone. Well, my part of being timer is going to tell you all what you have done, how many minutes you've talked, and everything. Now, on the word power, Steve, you are at 1 minute and 49 seconds. 
In Table Topics, April, 24 seconds. <laughs> Paul, 2 minutes and 22 seconds. Steve, 1 minute and 40 seconds. Carol, a minute and 12 seconds. And Adam, a minute and 57 seconds. Rick, your speech was 6 minutes and 38 seconds. Paul, your evaluation, you are 3 minutes and 19 seconds. Philippe, 35 seconds. And Steve, as general evaluator, a minute and 49 seconds. And that is it, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mary, for that time report. One of my responsibilities as the general evaluator for our meeting today is to provide some feedback on our overall meeting as well as any specific comments that haven't already been covered during our meeting. Additionally, I will give Paul a few comments on his evaluation. That's one of the roles of the general evaluator is to provide evaluation to the evaluators. Our meeting basically started on time. We videotape our <coughs> meeting, so we have the luxury of starting and stopping, but we did well. We will come in under our time that we're allotted today because we've had a little bit smaller meeting as far as attendance, but I would point out to you that the content was excellent, even though we were small in number. Rick, I really liked your speech. I enjoyed it a lot. One of the things that I would make you aware of is, I know you were working from a list, and that's quite a lot to work from, but if you could maybe use bigger print or something so that you don't have to look down at your notes and back up quite as much because your, your head bobbing was the only thing that I found a little bit distracting. And I know I have that issue too when I work with a manuscript or a speech that I'm reading things from and it's like, how do I keep from getting lost? And of course then the other thing is, how do I look through the right part of my glasses without <laughs> having my head bounce up and down too much? Our table topics, I want to thank everyone that participated today. Adam and April, I want to commend you on participating, even though you were probably unwilling participants. <laughs> you really did a good job, and April, only one ah is very good. Consider getting involved with Toastmasters in the future. You don't have to today, but Toastmasters is important because it helps us develop our speaking skills and we use them in all aspects of our life both interpersonally on the job and then we don't know when we may have to speak in front of a group of people and it could be a small group it could be a large group so you, you folks did very well today for your first table topics I want to congratulate you on that <laughs> Paul for your evaluation of Rick's speech I like that you gave or you started your evaluation with telling us what manual it was out of and the objectives, so we had an idea of what Rick was trying to achieve. You provided specifics, which is one of the important things with evaluating. Evaluation means you have to be an active listener, and you're identifying specifics that Rick did well. You used good body language with your evaluation when you were pointing out the different items that Rick was going through, and some of your own perspectives on it. You shared a little bit of your personal preferences as far as Rick's speech and that also influenced how you evaluate. Because when we serve as evaluators, we are evaluating that presentation from our perspective. It's really the only perspective that we can give when we do an evaluation. One thing I would suggest is that I couldn't really tell if you had identified some growth area for Rick or something that he might have wanted to improve or at least be aware of that he was doing. And I think that was the one thing that you overlooked in your presentation of evaluating his speech. Delete, good job. Ah counter, grammarian, and running a camera. I appreciate your Thank you. pitching in today as we were a little short on people and it meant I had one less thing I had to remember to do. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, thank you for timing. You always do a good job as far as telling us specifically what our times are, and everybody actually was within the time constraints that we allot for the different parts of our meeting. I think 
one of the other things that I'd like to make you aware of is we do have some slips of paper that we handed out in the studio here and there is an opportunity for you to provide feedback to anyone that participated in today's meeting. Maybe there's something that they did that you really liked. Maybe there was a thought that you had on something they could do to improve their presentation. So we do have those here and if you choose to fill one out and give it to an individual, it's a little add a boy or add a girl on what they're doing and it furthers our efforts to improve people's speaking and leadership skills by giving them constant constructive feedback. Carol, do you have something you want to come yeah. up here for? I'm going to call our Toastmaster up here one more time this morning. Carol? Thank you very much, Mr. General Evaluator, wearing that hat today. Rick, your speech, one of the things that made me think I don't cook. When my husband retired in 1986, he complained about my meals all the time, so the cook retired. We ate out all the time. I cook once a year on Christmas. My son's coming over today to put up my new desk that he's going to be picking up for me, and I invited him for supper because I said it's going to be longer than a 15-minute job. I haven't cooked. I'm going to have pork roast, pork tenderloin, and I Looking back, at, I keep track of who I invite and what they said about the food. Everything, pork roast, too dry, too dry, too dry. <laughs> so at the butcher's, I said, okay, how do I do this? And they said, get a meat thermometer. Well, my range has a meat thermometer, so I will use a meat thermometer, and it should be okay tonight. But that speech, I'm going, oh. <laughs> and Steve, one of the things that you pointed out with Rick, and a lot of us, if we learn, instead of looking down at our paper to look at the notes, if you'll notice when Steve was saying that, he looked with his eyes instead of his head. And that is not as distracting when you're looking down at your notes with your eyes instead of your head. So that's one little tip. And Delete, I want to let you know that he took the red eye from California, was it? And got in at midnight last night, but I had called to see if he's going to be here. He said, I'm coming. So I'd like to give everyone, if you enjoyed the meeting, let's hear it. And I'll return control the meeting to our president, Steve Ehrenholtz. Thank you, Carol. Let's give our Toastmaster, or Toastmistress, for today a round of applause, Carol. A few final things that I wanted to cover. Our next meeting will be Thursday, August 4th at 6 p.m. That's a Thursday evening. And we are always interested in having guests come and join us, come and observe. We won't put you on the spot. Maybe. <laughs> One of the things that I wanted to cover, uh, I'm the president for the 2011-2012 Toastmaster year, and I wanted to leave you with the mission of our club, the mission of a Toastmasters club. The mission of a Toastmasters Club is to provide a mutually supportive and positive learning environment in which every member has an opportunity to develop communication and leadership skills which in turn foster self-confidence and personal growth. Toastmasters is the kind of environment where you can come and try different speaking skills, try different speaking and presentation techniques. We also have a lot of opportunities for leadership and it's a place that is supportive and it's also safe. Your job doesn't depend on it, your performance evaluation doesn't depend on it. If it's something that kind of bombs, you'll get some feedback on what it was that made it that way and how you might want to avoid it next time. I'd like to ask our guests if they have any comments they'd like to share with us today as far as your, your meeting here. I know that you're attending this as a school project, and we really appreciate that, that come up. people come and <laughs> check us out. Hopefully we hope, that, we hope that we may even have some future Toastmasters, but would you like to come up and share a few comments on yeah. what you thought of today's meeting? I'll just ask Adam to come up. Well, I'll give you a pass. How's that? You're here with him anyway since it's his project. Yeah. Uh, basically, I am definitely afraid of getting up in front of people, giving speeches or anything. 
but the cohesiveness of this group and everybody was very nice and not unjudgmental in a way of being educational, but not as far as being judgmental. Um, would be something I probably would think about coming back to because it, it's just kind of enjoyable to hear. Um, I want to write a rebuttal to your speech, <laughs> so let young people know. Yeah, like we still remember where we parked our car. You know? <laughs> so, but no, I did enjoy it, and uh, I think it'll be a, a, some good things to you as uh, my course goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The other thing young people seem to really know how to remember is where in the world you go in Windows to find different <laughs> things, to change something. To me, there's just too many options. You know, I know it can be done, but it's like, where was that that I last saw it? Thank you for joining us, those of you who looked in from home. Thank you to everyone here in our studio. Again, our next meeting will Did be Brian have anything? <laughs> oh, yes we do have a, a cameraman that is helping us out today Brian do you want right. to give us any feedback <laughs> he it was a great experience <laughs> he, he's content to stay behind the camera he, he's having a really good experience here but he's going to <laughs> stick with his headset and his camera <laughs> our next meeting will be Thursday August 4th at the Anderson Town Center or Anderson Center Community Television Studio, 7850 Five Mile Road. Our next Saturday meeting will be August 20th, and that will start at 9 a.m. At this point, we are still putting together our agenda for that meeting, but regardless of what we have for that meeting, guests are always welcome. I'm going to adjourn. Club 9523 TV Toastmasters for July 16th, 2011.